Madden, take a look at this. Sundamon, did you discover something? Oh, this is the definition of the imaginary unit. Imaginary unit? Oh, yeah, I think I remember that. I is the number that becomes negative 1 when squared. This I is called the imaginary unit. By the way, it's also well known that negative I squared is negative 1 too. Huh? Really? I and negative I both become negative 1 when squared. Then, which one should we choose? Sandemon, wait! You shouldn't ask that question. What? Whoa, what was this? This is bad. Sundaman, what did you mean when you asked, which one should we choose? Uh, I didn't really mean anything deep by it. I and negative I, these two are indistinguishable. Huh? What do you mean? Even if you say they're indistinguishable, they obviously look different. No, that's not the point. This problem is much deeper than it appears. It seems the forbidden door has already been opened. Let's quickly analyze what just happened. Did I do something wrong? Any real number becomes non-negative when squared. Do you understand this? Yeah, that makes sense. If you multiply a positive by a positive, it's positive, and even a negative times a negative is still positive. Right, and that means there's no number that becomes negative when squared. The equation x squared equals negative 1 has no solution in the real numbers. But what if such a number did exist? Exactly, that's what the imaginary unit i is. But i is not the only number that satisfies that equation. If you calculate negative i squared, it's essentially the same as i squared, so the answer is still negative 1. That means the solutions to the equation x squared equals negative 1, or x equals plus or minus i. I see, so there are two solutions. Doesn't seem like there's any issue with that. Calm down and think carefully. There are two solutions to the equation x squared equals negative 1. Now then, which one did we choose as i? Huh? Um, which one was it? I'm not really sure. Yeah, we don't know. Maybe the i I chose is different from the i you chose. What do you mean? Actually, that might not be the best way to put it. Because in the first place, we don't even know what those two solutions truly are. But what we can say for sure is, if we call the one on the left i, then the one on the right is negative i. And if we call the one on the right i, then the one on the left is negative i. Hmm. Now that you say that, I'm not sure which is which anymore. Seems like you're starting to understand how serious this issue is. But it's not like there's no way to distinguish between them. Really? Tell me already. No need to rush. Let's look at this problem from a broader perspective. A broader perspective? Yes, I mean complex numbers. Oh right, of course. The system that combines real and imaginary numbers is called complex numbers. Let A and B be real numbers. Then a complex number can be written as A plus BI. Here, A is called the real part, and B is the imaginary part. Alright, it's all coming back to me. Now let's associate a complex number with a pair of real numbers. So, A plus BI corresponds to the pair AB. That means we're just extracting the real and imaginary parts into a pair, right? Exactly. And that pair of real numbers can be seen as a point on a plane. In other words, the complex number A plus BI corresponds to a point on the plane, like in this diagram. I remember now. A plane built this way using complex numbers is called the complex plane, right? Yes, this was a quick review of complex numbers and the complex plane. Now, let's get to the heart of the problem. Where does the imaginary unit I correspond to on this plane? Um... The imaginary unit I is, of course, a kind of complex number too. So if we break it into real and imaginary parts, it looks like this. The real part is 0, and the imaginary part is 1. So, extracting the real and imaginary parts, I corresponds to the point 0, 1. That sounds correct. Now, what about negative I? Negative I? Same idea applies here too. If we break down negative I into real and imaginary parts, we get this. Its real part is 0, and the imaginary part is negative 1. So by extracting the real and imaginary parts, negative I corresponds to the point 0, negative 1. You're doing great. If we represent these results in a diagram, it would look like this. On the complex plane, I corresponds to the point 0, 1, and negative I corresponds to the point 0, negative 1. Yeah. These two points are clearly in different locations visually, and their components are clearly distinguishable too. That means we can distinguish I from negative I. 
I is the point above, and negative I is the point below. So by treating I and negative I as points on the plane, we can clearly distinguish between them. Okay, problem solved. No, it's not over yet. What? The difference between I and negative I here isn't a fundamental one. Not fundamental. What are you talking about? Let's go back and think about it again. The two solutions of the equation x squared equals negative 1 can be written as plus or minus i if we choose 1 to be i. Here i and negative i are considered indistinguishable. That's the issue. But what does indistinguishable even mean in the first place? To clarify that, let's consider what distinguishable means instead. What does it mean to be distinguishable? Sounds interesting. By the way, Sundaman, do you know a similar example to this? Um, not sure. Then, how about thinking about the equation x squared equals 1? Hmm, I see. So the right-hand side is 1 instead of negative 1. Well, that's easy. The solutions to this equation are plus or minus 1. Well done. Earlier we had i and negative i, but now we have 1 and negative 1. The situations are pretty similar, but these two are clearly distinguishable. Okay, now let's take it one step further. As an example of how 1 and negative 1 are distinguishable, if you multiply 2 by 1, you get 2. Yeah, that's true. But if you multiply 2 by negative 1, the result is not 2. The answer becomes negative 2. That feels kind of obvious though. Wait, hang on a second. Multiplying by 1 leaves it unchanged, but multiplying by negative 1 changes it. Right, this shows a fundamental difference between the properties of 1 and negative 1. That's why we can say 1 and negative 1 are distinguishable. I see, so that's how you think about being distinguishable. But in that case, if we could find a property that differs between i and negative i, then we could say they are distinguishable too, right? That's an interesting way to think about it. But unfortunately, there's no fundamentally different property between the two. What? No way, that can't be true. There are clear differences between 1 and negative 1. Then i and negative i must have some different property too. I get how you feel. But no one has found such a property so far. Really? But maybe it just hasn't been found yet. We might discover it in the future. No, such a fundamentally different property will never be found. Why are you so sure about that? And what do you actually mean by fundamental anyway? Very well. Allow me to explain. The key to the story is the complex conjugate. The complex conjugate of a complex number a plus bi is defined as a minus bi. You're replacing plus b with minus b, so it's like flipping the sign of the imaginary part. Exactly. If you think of it on the complex plane, for example the conjugate of 3 plus 2i is 3 minus 2i. Flipping the imaginary part's sign means you're reflecting it vertically. So, it's a reflection. Taking the conjugate again should bring it back. Yeah, the complex conjugate has a kind of symmetry. By the way, note that the conjugate of i is negative i. I see, so i and negative i have a kind of symmetry between them. But just from this, saying i and negative i have no different properties feels like too much. Well, here's where it gets interesting. One of the properties of the complex conjugate is that it preserves the structure of addition. Wait. On the left side, you're adding and then taking the conjugate. But on the right, you're taking the conjugate and then adding. This means addition before taking the conjugate and addition after taking the conjugate have the same structure. I'll skip the proof here but you can easily show it by calculating directly from the definition. This applies not only to addition but also to multiplication. Multiplication before taking the conjugate and multiplication after taking the conjugate also preserve the same structure. This is kinda hard to understand. Okay, if we interpret this from a different angle, imagine two points z sub 1 and z sub 2 on the complex plane. Then define z sub 3 as the sum of the two. So in short, z sub 1 plus z sub 2 equals z sub 3. Here, the points are drawn in the upper half for simplicity, but they don't necessarily have to be there. Got it. Now, take the complex conjugate of each point. In other words, reflect them across the horizontal axis. Then, the sum of the conjugates of z sub 1 and z sub 2 will be the conjugate of z sub 3. This is just a different way of expressing the same formula we discussed earlier. That's really interesting. So basically, the same thing is happening in the mirror world? That seems to be the case. Of course, this is not limited to addition. The same thing holds for multiplication as well. 
When they cross top and bottom, it looks complicated at first, but taking the complex conjugate still swats the top and bottom. In short, the calculations with complex numbers before and after taking the conjugate are like two sides of the same coin. This is really cool! Since this holds true for the most fundamental operations, addition and multiplication, no matter how intricate the logic built on top of them becomes, there will never be any structural difference before and after taking the complex conjugate. And through the complex conjugate, i and negative i are matched together. In that sense, i and negative i form a pair, and no fundamental difference ever arises between them. So that's what it was all about. I feel like I kind of get it now. Maybe if i and negative i were swapped, no one would even notice. Just kidding. Well then, take care everyone. See you later.